Are there harms of artificial sweeteners that outweigh the benefits? We've asked this question before at Healthcare Triage, and the answer was no. There are loads of data that suggest artificial sweeteners are bad, but none of those data are good. There are good data suggesting that artificial sweeteners are just fine, but somehow those get ignored. Now we've got a study on another artificial sweetener, erythritol. And many of you have asked what our take is. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. To the research. The study in question, published in February in Nature Medicine, examined the relationship between erythritol consumption and cardiovascular events like heart attacks and stroke. The researchers examined outcomes in patients undergoing cardiac risk assessment, taking blood samples to examine circulating levels of several polyol sweeteners, including erythritol. After this, they examined platelet reactivity in vitro, that is, in a dish, after exposure to erythritol. They concluded that higher levels of these sweeteners in the blood were associated with increased risk for cardiovascular events, and that platelet reactivity was enhanced after exposure to erythritol in a dish. One of the biggest problems here is that erythritol is produced by our bodies. This is done via a pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. This pathway can become dysregulated when we eat lots of sugar or when our bodies aren't using glucose efficiently, which we call impaired glycemia. If this is the sort of situation we are in, we may be at a higher risk for cardiovascular events and have increased erythritol in our blood. So along comes a study that examines erythritol levels in the blood and the incidence of cardiovascular events, and bam, they come to the conclusion that the two are related. But instead of considering that information, about how erythritol is produced by our bodies, the great conclusion bell rings across the media and proclaims across the land that erythritol puts you at risk for heart attacks and stroke. Side note, the authors were more careful with their conclusions than the media was, so good on them. You know one of our major complaints about nutrition studies is that they rely on self-report data, meaning they just ask people to report what they've eaten over a period of time, usually a long period of time. This is hardly useful because self-reports are usually a pretty bad representation of what and how much was actually eaten. Fortunately, this study did not do that, and we want to give credit where credit is due. However, it does fall into the trap of the other thing we really hate about nutrition studies, correlation versus causation, or more specifically in this case, reverse causation. When a patient is at high risk for things like heart attacks and stroke, one of the first things we tell them is to change their diet. We recommend they eat less overall, and we usually recommend more specific changes, like lowering their sugar intake. Given that the patients examined for this study were already undergoing cardiac risk assessment, one might assume they received advice along these lines. One way that people might follow such advice, that is, eating fewer calories and less sugar, is by turning to artificially sweetened products. These people would have higher levels of artificial sweeteners in their blood, and they would be at higher risk of cardiovascular events, like heart attack and stroke. However, that would not be because the artificial sweeteners caused the heart attack and stroke. Instead, it would be that the high risk of heart attack and stroke led to increased consumption of artificial sweetener. This speaks to the fact that there are very likely going to be a number of lifestyle differences between people who consume artificial sweeteners and people who don't. We can't discount that any of those differences are actually responsible for outcomes like heart attack and stroke. And as much as we try, we cannot conduct an observational study and run enough statistical tests to rule out all those factors. To the researchers' credit, after the observational work and the work in the Petri dishes, they did conduct an actual intervention study. It wasn't randomized, which does matter a lot, but it was something, so we were looking forward to checking out those results. That, however, turned out to be impossible because the trial wasn't actually finished. Of the planned only 40 subjects, data from only eight appear to be included in this manuscript. That number is unacceptable for any real conclusions to be made, and it's completely unclear why the choice was made to move forward with publishing these preliminary results when the paper clearly states that the intervention is ongoing. Much like other evidence we've covered on artificial sweeteners, we saw nothing here to convince us of any danger. And the major point I hit on all the time that bears repeating, there is an abundance of evidence that overconsumption of sugar is contributing to health problems. If you have a desire to change your diet to better your health, lowering your sugar intake is a great evidence-based way to go.
Hey, did you enjoyed this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on artificial sweeteners and harm. We'd appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe down below and consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz, Edward Lillahome, and Brian Nam, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.